Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and welcome to episode 3 of my new series, Idiotic Questions That Flurfs Ask. Today's question is, is that Einsteinian or Newtonian gravity? At the risk of a spoiler alert, when these two theories are applied to non-relativistic terrestrial systems, they turn out to be observationally indistinguishable. Which is a fancy way of saying that for all practical purposes, the two theories produce identical results on the surface of Earth. As I discussed last time, Newton described gravity as the attractive force that operates between masses. In contrast to this interpretation, Einstein suggested that gravity is the propensity of objects to move along geodesics that follow the curvature of spacetime. From this perspective, gravity is not a force at all, simply a geometric consequence of the curvature of spacetime. So if one of these theories says that gravity is a force and the other one says that gravity isn't a force, how can the two theories be reconciled? The fundamental reality is that it matters not a whit whether or not gravity is a force. That's a metaphysical question. The physical question is how do particles react when acted upon by gravity? That's all that matters. If the two theories give exactly the same predictions for the motion of a particle when acted on by gravity, then there's no real difference between the two theories. So the central question becomes, how do particles in non-relativistic terrestrial settings respond to the action of gravity according to the theory of general relativity? I can think of no better person to answer this question than Einstein himself. In his 1916 paper, section 21 is entitled, translated into English, Newton's Theory as a First Approximation. Let's see what it says. In black on the left hand side of this slide is the text from the translation of Einstein's paper. For the purposes of simplicity, I have omitted some of the more technical details, but I have kept what I consider salient to my explanation. In blue on the right hand side is the simplified version. Einstein considers the case of a weak, analytically well-behaved gravitational field produced by matter that is moving slowly in comparison to the speed of light. He then suggests that when these approximations are plugged into his theory, it should produce Newton's theory. That's the quote in red at the bottom of the page. To simplify the presentation moving forward, I'm going to introduce the term conventional physical system. For this presentation, a conventional physical system is one in which the gravitational field is weak and analytically well behaved, and the matter generating the gravitational field is moving slowly relative to the speed of light. Returning to Einstein's paper, which I am again quoting in black, he moves on to plug the assumptions corresponding to a conventional physical system into his theory. Upon doing so, he is able to derive an equation for the acceleration experienced by a particle within a gravitational field, equation 67, and the form for the gravitational potential in equation 68. In Einstein's own words, equations 67 and 68 together are equivalent to Newton's law of gravitation. Finally, in equation 69, Einstein secures agreement between general relativity and the Newtonian theory for this case by using the universal gravitational constant to define his free parameter curly k. So, it is apparent from the 1916 paper in which he presents the theory of general relativity that Einstein designed this theory exactly to coincide with Newtonian theory for terrestrial systems. The oft-repeated Flurfer claim that Einstein and Newtonian gravity are completely irreconcilable is simply false. For conventional physical systems, as I have defined them, both theories yield practically indistinguishable descriptions of particle motion. So as we have established, Einstein himself viewed Newtonian theory as the natural limit of general relativity in terrestrial and near-terrestrial settings, and to be a very accurate description of particle motion under the influence of gravity in such systems. These interpretations of the relationship between Newtonian gravity and general relativity have been shared and reinforced by subsequent investigators publishing in this arena. As this sequence of articles demonstrates, the Newtonian limit of general relativity remains an ongoing target of academic investigation. Newtonian theory has neither been superseded nor discarded. So a logical consequence of all of this is that if you are a flurf and the Earth is the entire universe, then there is no distinction between Einsteinian and Newtonian theory. There's no evidence that general relativity is correct, nor is there any evidence that Newtonian theory is inaccurate or inadequate. Well, in that case, why does everybody think that Einstein was such a clever clogs? It turns out that beyond the terrestrial system, there are in fact examples where Newtonian theory is inaccurate. 
In his 1916 paper, Einstein resolved a decades-old scientific puzzle by accurately calculating the precession of the perihelion of Mercury's orbit around the Sun using the theory of general relativity. In an earlier paper, Einstein had calculated the degree of curvature to be expected by light rays passing near to the Sun under both general relativity and Newtonian theory. The difference between the two theories' predictions was large enough that it was thought to be observationally detectable. In order to determine whether either theory matched observations in reality, two expeditions were dispatched to simultaneously observe the 1919 total eclipse of the Sun. The curvature of light around the Sun observed by these expeditions was clearly in accord with Einsteinian theory, general relativity, and not with Newtonian theory. These two results demonstrate that close to the Sun, where the gravitational field is much, much stronger than it is on Earth, general relativity is observably more accurate than Newtonian theory. But it is worth pointing out that from a FLIRF perspective, neither of these observations can possibly be valid, because they both require that the standard scientific understanding of the solar system is correct, and that the Earth is a spherical planet orbiting the Sun. It is therefore something of a mystery why FLIRFs insist on discussing a theory that unambiguously demonstrates that they are completely and utterly wrong. Perhaps they think that talking authoritatively about Einstein and general relativity will make them sound less like a pig ignorant no talent ass clown. If such is their hope, I have some bad news for them. Getting back to Einstein, how did he produce the predictions that were confirmed by these observations? Again, I'm just going to quote from his papers in the black text. In basic terms, he used the Newtonian theory as a first approximation and applied small deviations from that theory to consider more complicated systems. This approach is called the post-Newtonian formalism, and Newton and his colleagues refined it across multiple publications. But in all cases, the basic methodology was the same. Use Newtonian theory as a first approximation and apply higher order corrections to generalize. For those of you who are fans of mathematical terminology, what Einstein was doing was expanding a power series around the Newtonian approximation. This was quite a complicated exercise because the full field equations of general relativity are nonlinear. As a result, obtaining an accurate solution of the field equations in an arbitrary situation where the gravitational field may be very strong and very complex in geometry actually requires a computational approach, but Einstein didn't have access to any computers. And obviously, he wasn't alone. Practically no one had access to computers for scientific purposes before the 1950s. And even those first computers were simply not powerful enough to attack the problem of general relativity applied to extreme physical systems. Thus, by necessity, any researcher who wanted to apply the theory of general relativity to astrophysical systems had to do so analytically via the post-Newtonian formulation. As this list of references shows, post-Newtonian formalism has not in fact been abandoned. The post-Newtonian approximation remains extremely useful when modelling large physical systems in strong gravitational fields. For this class of system, a full numerical solution of Einstein's field equations would be computationally prohibitive. In order to reduce the numerical expense of achieving a solution, the Newtonian approximation is an extremely useful resource. The enduring validity and utility of the post-Newtonian approximation, first introduced by Einstein, is entirely due to the fact Newtonian theory provides an extremely good first approximation for the response of particles and physical systems even in relatively strong gravitational fields. As we have seen, FLIRF claims to the contrary are directly contradicted by the scientific literature and may be dismissed as simple lies. The Flurfer argument goes as follows. Einstein contradicts Newton. Therefore, we cannot use Newtonian theory. But the Flurfs then turn around and say that Einstein was wrong. There's no Earth-based evidence that Einstein was right. So there. Obviously, these two logical propositions are directly contradictory. It cannot be the case that Einstein's formulation is true and invalidates Newtonian theory and is simultaneously false and doesn't need to be considered by the Flurfs. But even leaving that fundamental problem aside, there is an even more fundamental issue. Both of these statements are factually incorrect. Einstein, as we have seen, does not contradict Newton. Einstein, in fact, asserts that Newtonian theory is extremely accurate in terrestrial systems. Similarly, we actually do have terrestrial evidence that supports the curvature of space-time as proposed by Einstein. 
Einstein demonstrated that as a consequence of the theory of general relativity, a clock in a strong gravitational field will run more slowly than a clock in a weak gravitational field. Because the strength of Earth's gravitational field decreases as you increase in distance from Earth's center of mass, Earth makes a very convenient laboratory for testing this phenomenon. Einstein suggested that the physical process in which this effect might most readily be observed is the upward propagation of photons through a gravitational field. Gravity is weaker at the front of the photon and stronger at the back of the photon. So time is running more quickly at the front of the photon than at the back of the photon. So the front of the photon moves faster than the back of the photon. As a result, the wavelength of the photon increases and the frequency decreases. As the photon moves upward, it becomes redshifted. This effect was first observed on the surface of Earth by the famous Pound-Rebka experiment. This initial result has been validated and replicated many times since by subsequent publications, using a variety of different methodologies and experimental setups. The fact that space-time curves, as Einstein predicted, is thus confirmed observationally. The thing to note about these results, however, is that they confirmed the value for the strength of Earth's gravitational field and its gradient that were obtained by Newton. So in the one fell swoop, these experiments confirm both Einstein's geometric argument and the validity and accuracy of the Newtonian approximation. If you're still awake, congratulations again, you may have noticed that I'm picking my words with great care. Observations of gravitational redshift at Earth's surface demonstrate that space-time is curved, but they do not necessarily demonstrate that the full theory of general relativity is necessarily correct. For that, we have to rely on extraterrestrial observations. On Earth's surface, there is another theory that can explain these results. Geometrized Newtonian gravity, or as it is more commonly known, Newton-Cartan theory. Newton-Cartan theory takes the geometrical formulation of general relativity. That is to say that gravity is entirely a consequence of the curvature of space-time. But instead of using the density of energy, as Einstein did, Newton-Cartan theory uses only the density of conventional matter. As a result, particle motions calculated using Newton-Cartan theory are exactly the same as particle motions calculated using Newtonian theory. But Newton-Cartan theory additionally explains the effects of space-time curvature observed in near-Earth systems, which demonstrates a beautiful irony. If you're considering only Earth-based systems, you don't need Einstein's theory of general relativity, but you still need Newtonian gravity. As much as the Fleurs try to wriggle and squirm, Newton's gravity has them firmly in its grip. This last list of references concerning Newton-Cartan theory might be a bit superfluous, but it gives me an opportunity to sneak in an Easter egg that I'm hoping people will enjoy. Or at least those people who are still awake might enjoy. Okay, so let's review. Einstein, like any sane individual, understood and accepted the observational evidence supporting the accuracy of Newtonian theory in a terrestrial setting. As we have seen, Einstein dedicated significant effort to ensuring that general relativity and the Newtonian theory of gravity are in accord in terrestrial and near-terrestrial settings. Any claim that Einstein debunked, contradicted, disproved or invalidated Newtonian theory is utterly mendacious gibberish. We have also seen that Einstein considered Newtonian theory to be the natural first approximation to the theory of general relativity, even in settings with reasonably strong gravitational fields. The validity and accuracy of the Newtonian approximation has been analytically and observationally demonstrated many times. Any claim that Newtonian gravitational theory has been superseded or made redundant by general relativity is based on colossal ignorance of the scientific literature, which unambiguously and emphatically contradicts any such position. And finally, Einstein's claim that space-time is curved has also been observationally demonstrated many times using different techniques. Any claim that the curvature of space-time has not yet been demonstrated is a blatant falsehood. Okay, well that might be where I leave it for today. Thank you so much for listening. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you'll join me next time. <music>